great. Well, boys and girls, I'm Mrs. Collins from Farm Smart. We're so glad to have you joining us again this Friday for our virtual Imperial Valley Live field trip. Today we are with uh, Mr. Scott Howington. He's a local farmer and a grower, and he's going to be telling you about what's happening in his field. And we have a lot of questions for you, Mr. Howington. So go oh, ahead boy. and get started. Go good morning, everybody. It's, uh, it's great to be here. My name is Scott Howington. I grow organic produce for a company called Lakeside Organic Gardens, and we're here at one of the uh, one of their fields that we're harvesting at this moment, red leaf um, lettuce. So um, what you're seeing here is uh, is there's there's guys cutting up ahead, and then back behind you, Stacy, you'll see these guys will come back and they'll start packing the 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 heads that have been cut. They put 24 heads in a box or 12, depends on the order. We can we pack it both ways. Um, some some stores like 12 counts, some stores like 24 counts. Um, it, in every block of, of mixed lettuce that we plant, and that's what this is referred to as mixed lettuce because we have, we have the red lettuce that they're cutting now, then we have green lettuce just past that, and then we have romaine. So every block that we plant we plant at the harvest at a certain time, and we just move from one block to the next, and we have all three items in each block. Um, it's about half romaine, 25% green leaf, and 25% red leaf. And that's kind of how the, the demand usually plays out. How big is a block? Every block is four acres. So what we do is about every two to three days, we, we harvest four acres and we just keep moving like that. We started last week and we'll go through the middle of March. I would like to remind all the boys and girls, especially those who have been with us for all of our field trips, how big is an acre? How big is an acre? We have a special way to describe that. So I don't know what they're thinking, but boys and girls, if you remember, an acre is about the size of a football field. So Mr. Howington is harvesting four football fields full of vegetables. Right, and that's that's the mixed lettuce. We, we also grow, um, we have about 48 different items that we grow. So we have mixed lettuce, we have head lettuce that we'll be watching them cut pretty soon. Over across the way, so it's a long ways over there, but you'll see them, they're harvesting broccoli over there. Um, then we have, we have various other things too, but that's kind of what you, we could see right here just from where we're standing. Awesome. So, About how many people are out there working? So it, de it depends. On a normal day, we're just getting started. On a normal day, um, once we get going full blast, which will be about two weeks, there's about 300 people in total in, in all the crews. Um, right now, this is a this is the beginning of a mixed crew that it's about half it's about half full right now, um, just because we're starting. It'll pick up by next week. There'll be uh, roughly about twelve to thirteen people in this crew. So um, the other the other thing that you can't see, he's not doing it right now, but if you look down there at the end, you'll see a backpack with water with a water tank on it. Um, and what they do is, I'll show you what he comes by. And when they first cut lettuce, any kind of lettuce, there's it, this has already been washed, but there's like a milky uh, substance that kind of bleeds out of the out of the butt of the lettuce. And what they'll do is they'll come by and wash that off. Because if you don't wash it off, I don't know if you've seen it in the store sometimes, this thing will turn pink or even kind of a light purple. And that's what causes that to change colors. So we try to wash it all off before we pack it. Why don't you tell us where you're at? Because sometimes I think boys and girls think that we're doing a film from someone that's very far away. But where are you? Oh, I'm, I'm right by IVC. If, every, if anybody knows, I'm between Imperial and IVC right now. So right in the middle of Imperial Valley. I'm not that far away from anybody, so this is I don't happening, think. This is happening right now where these boys and girls live. And they probably pass by right. you many times before. Yeah, and what you see, what you just saw with with uh, with the with the pan there is the is the city of Imperial, actually the west side or the east side of Imperial. So we're okay. we're, we're pretty well, close to Imperial, and and yeah, so we're close. I we're all we're right we around you. We have some Imperial um, students online with us. Go ahead. Oh, fun. Okay. Well, we're gonna we're gonna head over. You'll you'll see right now. They're 
they were cutting green leaf a little while ago, and these guys are picking up the boxes now and putting them on that trailer. Um, once they pick up, once once they pick up that green leaf and this red leaf, they'll take that trailer into the cooler in Hopeville, and they'll they'll do what they call a uh, a vacuum cool on it. It's called a hydro vac. Because so what they'll do is they'll spray a little bit. They put it in a vacuum, a big huge vacuum. And they spray water on it and it suck the, suck all the moisture out. And they'll do that a few times. And that cools the lettuce down, cools it down to about, oh, 36, 35, 36, 37 degrees. And that's what keeps it fresh. And then they'll put it in the coal room. It's like a big refrigerator. And they'll try to keep that coal room 38, 39 degrees. And that's what holds the freshness in the product um, at, before it, until it gets to the store and to your house. So when the trucks come to pick it up, it it's looks, the same. It looks like that field. It looks like that field was very well harvested. Like not very much was left behind. Correct. Yeah, that's 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 how we try to make it happen. It doesn't always happen that way, but that's the idea. We like to. What happens we like, if it gets left behind? I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? What happens if you have something that gets left in the field? What happens to that food? Usually, usually it just gets this up and and I know a lot of people think that that's a waste, but the problem is, is it costs so much money to harvest it, put it in a box, take it to the cooler, cool it, and then if and then it was so you would have to spend a lot of money just to give it away at that point. Um, and I mean, just the box itself is almost two dollars. Wow. So so you can see that. By the time you cool it and pay the guys to cut it and all that stuff, you would be spending a lot of money um, just to go give it away. And, and unfortunately, you know, you just can't afford to do that. Yeah. So, and that's that's a really bad feeling sometimes because if the markets aren't good, sometimes we don't harvest very much at all. We'll leave, you know, whole sections of a field that didn't get harvested because it, the market wasn't worth it. And every so, single one was picked by hand, was harvested by a person. Is that correct? Well, that's correct. Yeah, it was it was cut by one person, put in a box by another person. These gentlemen here stack it on the trailers. They they actually, if you notice, they there's a, st a special stack. You got three. The bottom three are facing one direction. The next two, the next direction, then back the other three. And that that's called a tie. It kind of ties it in so the boxes don't fall. Um, right now they're tied down as you can see, but once they get to the cooler, they take those ropes off and, and the pallet, they'll pick it up with the forklift and that pallet just has to have enough integrity. It has to be solid enough that it doesn't fall over. And that's why they, they, st they have to know how to stack it. That's a pretty high stack. <laughs> yeah, 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 they, uh, you know, it, it's, it's all about cost. And what they'll do is they'll pick, picture that whole trailer loaded as tall as the top one is. They'll pick that up and that vacuum tube I was telling you about, it's big enough to put 24 pallets in there. So all, all that you see here, the whole length of that trailer full of boxes will go in one time at the, into the cooler at the, into the hydro cooler at the, at, in the whole bill. So is that tractor going to drive that um, that trailer all the way to the um, to Hopeville to the cooler? No, no. There's a truck that comes by, brings empties. He brings empties with cartons on them, and then he leaves them and he picks up the full trailers of, of product and drives them to Hopeville. Cool. We may we may be able to see one come before this is over. They usually the first loads usually come in about ten o'clock, so we may be able to catch the first truck. In looks order like, to looks like it's kind of muddy out there. What kind of soil do you have five, out there? Uh, this is really good ground. Um, it's it's kind of a, a sandy loam, I would say. It's got a little bit of clay to it, but it's it's a light soil. Um, so it's 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 really good ground. That's why that's why we're able to cut so much of everything that's here <laughs> because the ground's good. So. Well, this is, this is Healthy Soils Month all around the nation and actually around the world. Um, so if you could um, maybe talk a little bit about your soil too and show us, show us some soil, that'd be interesting. Sure. Um, I'll tell you what, we could, we could probably just stop right here and I'll, uh, 
I'll, I'll just get a handful of, of dirt here and, and show you what I'm talking about by if dirt is too, has too much clay in it, when it's wet like that, it just sticks together. It doesn't crumble. And you can see how this dirt, even though it's a little bit wet, it still crumbles. And that's something that you really want to, you want to look, look for when you're picking ground to grow vegetables in is you, you want to try to get that, that kind of soil that even when it's wet, it's still crumbly. It doesn't, it doesn't stick, get real tight. Um, the other, what we do too is this, is, this happens to be an organic ranch. And most of what I do is organic, almost 100%. And so we have to take care of our soil a little differently than, than a normal um, farmer, than a conventional farmer. We can't use um, any, any uh, man-made substances. We have to use only things from nature. So we put a lot of compost on every year to keep our soils healthy. We use um, uh, uh, about 10 tons to the acre. So that's about, if you could think of a truck with two trailers behind it, that's about one trailer for every football field, as you guys like to say, that we, that we put on of compost every year. I'm gonna walk over here to where they're packing head lettuce. Um, right. So we can, you... we, can, we can take some questions right now if you'd like. Sure, there, um, some students are wanting to know like how long it takes to grow lettuce. Oh, that's a good question. So it's a little bit tricky and that's where, that's where, that's where we try to do our best, um, our best guesswork because when you first start, like when it's hot when we plant it, it'll, it can come as quick as about 75 days. Um, but then the stuff that we're planting now, because it's gonna be cold, it might take as long as 110 to 120 days. So you really have to watch, watch your, your average temperatures for the time you plant and, and kind of make it all work so that every single day of the, of the season, you have some place to go cut. And as we all know, vegetables, um, unlock a lot of things, they have a, they have an expiration date when you can eat them and they have an expiration date when you can cut them. So if a field's ready to cut today, you really only have three or four days to get it all done before the, the product becomes over mature. So it's, it's a lot Why of guesswork. Why don't you explain what they're doing here for us? Okay, so what they're doing here is they're, they're packing head lettuce. So, um, They've, they've, they've actually come and cut before they got here because we had a flat tire on the machine. Normally they would just be cutting and the guys picking it up would be cutting it and putting it um, without a bag right on that tray. So normally this, this gentleman here wouldn't have it bagged already. He would just cut it, put it on that tray. Then the, the ladies that are working on the tray, they would actually put, a, put it in a bag. They tape the bottom of the bag and then they put it in that box. Again, we do 12 count and 24 counts. These, have, these are 12 count. The customer they're cutting for now wants it in 12 count boxes. Um, a lot of customers like it that way, um, but some want 24 counts. And then it also, with the fact that you're putting it in a bag, is that because the customer wants it in the bag? So some customers want it in a bag and some customers don't? Correct. And it, and it used to be where very few people, well, I remember when nobody put it in a bag and then a few people wanted it in a bag, but now because of food safety issues, um, almost everybody wants the product bag before they take it. Um, very few stores like to put it um, out in the open without it being protected now, nowadays. So there are a couple of questions about food safety. This might be a good um, place to highlight some of your protocols and some of the things mm -hmm. you do to keep your workers safe, as well as our food safe. Okay, so th there's a whole lot of things we do, especially for what we call leafy greens, like lettuces, spinach, um, uh, parsley's, uh, um, cabbages. But, but for all products, there's a lot of protocols also, but the leafy greens are especially, especially stringent. Um, so every time we put water on a field, if it has to be watered before, if it gets watered by overhead sprinklers, we put chlorine in the water to clean the water up, make sure that there's no germs living in the water before we put the water on. Um, so basically it's the, it becomes almost, well, it is the same water in essence that you, that you get in your faucet at home. It's, it's that clean now. We have, uh, 
I can't show you, there's not one close by, but every sprinkler pump has, has a big barrel of chlorine and it's computerized. So it knows how much chlorine to put out depending on how much water is going through the pipe. And it constantly adjusts itself so that it has the right amount of chlorine in it. Um, the other thing that we do is we monitor the fields um, for wildlife activity or domestic animal like, you know, dogs or cats or anything getting in the field. Um, we, we, we monitor the fields, keep that out. If we do find traces of animal activity, we cordon it off. We don't cut within 20 feet of that. Um, just leave that in the field because we don't know what, what that animal might have had on it. Um, we obviously, like everybody should, wash our hands every time they, every, every time they take a break or go to the restroom. Um, they obviously wash their hands like we all should, even, even before COVID and especially with COVID. Um, the other thing, we, they're all, they all have training on what to look for um, as far as when they're, when they're packing the product. If they see, see anything on the product, um, they, they, uh, they, don't, they won't pack it and they'll, they'll, leave some, they'll leave a little area around it. Same thing if somebody were to get cut. There's a lot of sharp knives around here that people use. When people get cut, they immediately leave the field. We skip where the, where the person got cut to make sure that you know, no blood got on anything. And uh, that person leaves the field and, and gets first aid right away. Um, trying to think every. Can you tell us a little bit about how, how you control some of the pest in the organic field? Yeah, that's a big challenge. So um, the way we do it is we use uh, organically approved materials, which um, sometimes what we'll do, kind of the most exciting thing I always thought was that we'll do is we'll put in predator bugs bugs that eat other bugs so like ladybugs la lady yeah we'll try ladybugs sometimes but more than that we'll put in a, a, a bug called a lacewing um they're not as they don't eat as much as ladybugs but ladybugs fly too well and they tend to leave where you put them they they go where they want to go not where you leave them and the lacewing we actually let them go as eggs so they're born they don't have wings when they're born they live about well, it depends on the temperature, but they can live, you know, two or three weeks as as a, a bug that, that doesn't doesn't have wings that can't fly. So it spends all of its time eating other insects in the field. So you actually um, purchase like a box of those bugs to release in your field or those eggs? Many, many boxes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, many, many boxes. Um, and that that's that's normally for aphid control. Um, that's about the best thing we have for aphid. We do have some organic sprays that we put on, but they're not, they're not very effective, honestly. So if you have a little problem, you can take care of it with, the, with some of the organic pesticides. But if you have a very big problem, they, they just don't, they, they're just not, they, don't, they don't kill enough to make, to make a, a big enough difference. Um, but, but then for worms, we do have good products. We do have, uh, we have a product called Diatomaceous Earth. We have a product called Entrust. Um, there's several products that, that are actually pretty effective against worms. So that, um, that really doesn't, that, that's, a, that's fairly easy uh, pest to control nowadays. A harder one is the white fly um, that we really struggle with, especially early on, um, white fly and flea beetles, they're little bugs that live in the dirt. And they really cause us a bad time because we don't have any, any material to control them. Um, grasshoppers are the same thing when it's hot. They'll eat up little plants as they're first coming up. So um, that's just a struggle. Us... Sorry to interrupt. Could you show us um, or maybe demonstrate or show like where the seeds from lettuce come from? Oh, shoot. Yeah. Um, I, I, okay. So if we, if this field were to go to seed, I'll show, I'll have Stacy. Let's, let's look at this head of lettuce right here. If 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 this if this was gonna in a in a in a, a few weeks right in the middle of this head I don't have a knife so I can't cut it real neat but right in the middle of this head a stalk would come out right here it would come out of here it would grow really really fast it would come through the the head of the lettuce it would come right through the heart of the lettuce pop out the top and then it would flower. And then it would, it would have to pollinate. And lettuce is something that you don't need bees to pollinate it. They'll, just the wind will pollinate it. And, and then that, that flower produces the seeds that, that where we get our seeds to plant the lettuce. 
So we don't grow any lettuce seed in this area uh, because we, we harvest a lot of lettuce. And um, there's a lot of reasons probably why we don't grow seed, probably don't have the right weather for it, but also you don't, you don't want to have a seed crop. You don't want to have a crop in the field for a long period of time um, that's also a crop you're growing commercially to, to harvest because of disease and things like that that will build up in the area. So, so they kind of keep, usually they, they'll keep the, the, the seed crop and the production crop areas a little bit separate, separated. Um, and then also you need special weather to, to, to make seed, to make seed. Someone's asking, what's the farthest place you've ever shipped the, the lettuce? Like how far is this lettuce gonna go? The furthest I've seen it go, and a lot of it goes there, is to Canada. It goes to Montreal, Toronto, a lot goes to Toronto, Canada. Goes all over the East, it goes all over the United States. Um, we, other than Canada, though, I don't think we ship any, any, any internationally except Canada. I was, someone was asking about the water, like how often do you water your field? Yeah, and that depends. Um, different stages of when, when it's really small, we have to water it more because it's got a very small root system. As it gets bigger, like like this this year, this time of year, it's cool. Probably about every two weeks, we'll put water on it. Um, as it warms up, maybe every week to ten days, and it just kind of depends. You have to check the soil and see when it's drying down, um, and then make that call to water it. You you can't just look on the calendar, but but this time of year, I would say I would pretty safely say about two weeks, every two weeks. Um, someone's asking about how much seed you plant each year, and that's usually measured in pounds, isn't it? Like how many pounds of seed? Is that how you buy it? Yeah, well, it depends on the seed. Some seed we buy by pounds, and some si seeds we buy per thousand seed. So like lettuce, we buy per thousand. Um, you would, and so like you buy a box, it would have 400,000, usually comes in 400,000 um, box units. And one box of lettuce seed will plant about four to five acres of lettuce, so four to five football fields, one box. And that's all done by machine, is that correct? You have a machine yes. that um, implement that plants lettuce? Yeah, and, and actually we're still planting lettuce right now, just not right here. But we, we, are, we will continue to plant lettuce for the next, oh, we'll probably finish up in about two weeks. But yes, that is by a machine. It it covers four rows with two lines on each on each machine on each row, and it works off of a vacuum. What it does is you put the seed in, into a hopper, and 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 there's a vacuum that runs, and you have a, a a plate with little holes in a circle. And as that plate turns, it the vacuum sucks the seed one seed onto each hole, and then when it when it gets to a certain part, then the 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 you know, for every vacuum, you have to have an escape for the air that you're that you're sucking in. So that escape shoots back in at a, another chamber in that in that planter and shoots the seed out so that it drops out, out of the hole. And that's it's kind of hard to explain. I don't know if that was a very good job, but um, hopefully one of these times we can actually we can actually show you guys planting lettuce. So what about um? Do you have anything that you use transplant? Someone's asking if you grow your plants in a in a pot, but these are often in a field. But do you use any other anything you grow that you use a transplant? A lot of a lot of things. We we grow celery is all from transplants. Our cauliflower and red cabbage is all from transplants, as well as the chards and kales, and fennel, and Brussels sprouts. We transplant the early broccoli. Um, all the baby broccoli is transplanted. So there's a, there's probably, I would say 30 to 35% of what we plant comes from transplants, but lettuce is not one of them. Yeah. And what about um, on varieties of lettuce? Someone's asking how many different kinds of lettuce there is. So, so there's, okay, so that's kind of a complicated question. So varieties, um, let's just say, let's just talk about head lettuce. So this is called iceberg lettuce or head lettuce. And there's several different varieties and they're all very time sensitive. Um, there's, a, there's a certain time where you plant different varieties. For instance, what they're, what they're planting right now is a variety called Jupiter. Right next door, um, I don't know if you could see the difference, but kind of a different tinge to the, to the lettuce over there. That's a variety called um, Dover. So there's very time sensitive 
varieties of head lettuce that you, that you plant. As far as different types of lettuce, there's a lot of different types of lettuce also. You have the iceberg head lettuce here, the red green that we saw over there, romaine. There's a butter lettuce that we also grow. Um, it looks like a it looks a little bit like a head lettuce, but it's much smaller and much more tender. And we grow a red and green version of that. Do you usually know in advance like what what you're going to sell? Like like who's asking for what? Like which so like a supermarket wants so much of a certain variety, so you know how much to plant. Well, you kind of do. So so you can never for sure tell what you're going to get out of each field, but you have a good idea. We, we contract or lakeside contracts, I would say probably about 40% of what they plant. Um, and so, so yes, they, they do know about 40% what the customer is going to want. Um, but the other 60% is just on the open. You just, um, you just give it your best, your best guess and, um, and, you know, try to play the market. And sometimes that's, that can, that can be really good. Um, and sometimes it can be really bad. So but it's just the way, just the way it is. You, you know, the, the stores aren't going to, they're not going to contract everything with you, but everybody wants to get like a little bit covered, but then they want to, they want to play the open market as well. I always liked finding new varieties and trying them. That's always fun and interesting to try new, new vegetables and see different mm -hmm. types of varieties. Um, someone is asking about um, the workers, like what is their work schedule? Like how many hours do they work and how many days? So they, they, they usually work five to six days a week. Um, normally it's about eight hours a day. Sometimes we'll, sometimes we'll get behind and we'll go a little longer, um, but, but not, usually not more than about nine because it's just, it's very tiring work. It's very hard work and it, and it, and it, and it gets tiring. The other, the other problem we have is this time of year, of course, the sun goes down early. So you can't really do this kind of work at night. Um, you can't really do this kind of work at, at night, so um, so that that limits the number of hours they can work. The other the other limiting factor, and it's hard on everybody, is if we have ice in the morning. So you you know a lot of times you don't know you're going to have ice, or even if you do know you're going to have it, you don't know when it's going to thaw out. You can't cut you can't harvest vegetables when they when they have ice on them, because if you touch them and they and they're frozen, it will actually kill those cells. So you won't see it right away, but within a few hours, wherever you've touched that frozen vegetable, it will it will bruise and, and, and in essence die. Those cells will die, so it'll it'll start to decay really fast. So sometimes when it, when there's ice, you know, we'll come in at eight o'clock in the morning, but we can't start till nine or ten or eleven. You're just standing around trying to stay warm. <laughs> exactly. So these kids have a lot of questions about bugs. They like those questions about insects. Like so someone's asking if, if you've ever had a field that was severely infested. Yes, yes, I have. Um, as a matter of fact, I think that's kind of the biggest risk you have with organic farming is that your, your toolbox, that the items you have to combat bugs, pests are, is limited. So there's a pretty good chance of things happening where um, you just can't harvest the field because the bugs literally took it over. It usually isn't a whole field like like this field we're in now is 70 acres. Um, each block is is four acres like we talked about. So usually it won't it doesn't happen to the whole 70 acres, but it could happen to you know three or four blocks within that 70 where the bugs just get so bad that um, you know you just can't you just can't harvest it. You can't you can't uh, you can't market them. Yeah. You know, sometimes I've noticed that if I know a field's organic, sometimes it smells a little fishy. Can you describe oh, what that is? Yeah, I can. So, so a lot of people use what is called liquid fish. And, and all it is is they, they go to the fish market, the fish factories, with, after they've finished with, with uh, uh, you know, processing the fish that they, that they have and everything that's left over, it's kind of a liquid and it's just made up of all kinds of fish parts, right? And, and some people use that as fertilizer. I don't because I don't like that smell. <laughs> so I don't use it, but, but, but some, far, some organic farmers do. The other thing about it is, believe it or not, it's super expensive and there's very little, um, 
so the big, the big, the big elements we use in, in farming and fertilizer is nitrogen, potassium, phosphate, and sulfur. Those are the big four. There's a lot of miners, but those are the big major parts of what we need. The biggest part of that being nitrogen. So this liquid fish, aside from the fact that it's doesn't smell very good, um, it also has, it's very expensive and it has very little nitrogen in it. So I, I used it a long time ago when I first started because everybody did, but I've gotten to where I don't use any of it anymore. I haven't used it in years. So, uh, so it doesn't rain very much here, which is one of the reasons why we can grow all these vegetables. But someone's asking, what happens when it rains? Do you still have to go out and harvest the, the vegetables? We, we do. And that those are really bad days. Um, some days it gets so bad that you can't. I mean, the, the equipment just gets stuck and you and you you literally can't can't do it. But but nowadays with the with the tractors we have now, the full wheel drive mudders, they call them mudders actually, and and they can they can deal with some pretty nasty conditions, some pretty muddy conditions. You know, unfortunately, it's hard. It's much harder for for people working in the mud, as you can imagine. You're slipping, you're sliding, you're falling down. It's 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 a mess. But they still try to do it until it just becomes impossible. Now, I love this next question. Um, this is a, um, a question. A, a student has read a book called The Three Sisters Garden. Are you familiar with that? I am the not. The Three Sisters? I am not. Oh, well, you'll have, to ask Ms. you'll have to ask Mrs. Howington about that book. But I the book is about, um, kind of, the book is about, um, it's a children's book, and it's about, like, coordinating um, what you grow and how, you grow things working together. So I'm going to kind of say it's kind of like a crop rotation question. So uh -huh. what are some companion things that you can grow with lettuce or when you're not growing lettuce? So our, I, I know what you're talking about, uh, about the companion things. And we've kind of tried that in the past, but it's, 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 you can grow them together. It becomes a harvesting nightmare though because even though they might grow together they don't harvest together so you're trying to keep one thing wet and the other thing dry and it just becomes really tough but we do we do um do a crop rotation so basically what what we do is within a within a 10 year span we won't put crops that are that are that are familiar i'm saying familiar like in the same family so for instance broccoli cauliflower cabbage Every 10 years, we'll only try, we'll try to only plant those three out of those 10 years in those, in those certain fields. All the lettuces, the same thing. Um, we, we, try to, we try to rotate those out and put different, different crops in there so that we only have you know, three, three years out of 10 with a lettuce crop. Um, fortunately for us, we grow a lot of stuff. We grow radishes, we grow spinach, we grow celery, we grow chards and kales, uh, turnips, rutabagas, red beets. We have, we grow a lot of products. So we're, we're a little bit flexible there, um, probably a little more flexible than most folks, but that's what we, we try to do. It, 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 you can imagine with all these fields, I mean, I think we have 23 different fields and each one of them has, you know, 40 or 70 or 40 football fields, but you try to, you try to keep track of where everything has been the last 10 years. And it's a challenge, but we try to do it. That's good for the soil too, since we're talking about healthy soils, right? It, it's not only it's it's good for the soil in the respect that um, that certain plants um, use more minor elements out of the out of the soil than others do. So you have that rotation going on. The probably the more important thing because you can always put elements in the soil. You can always add magnesium or whatever boron, whatever minor you you might be short. You can always add that. The biggest factor is that you don't build up disease in the soil. So let's say you have, for instance, lettuce, sclerotini is a big problem. So if you grow lettuce after lettuce after lettuce, um, you'd begin to, the soil begins to develop uh, sclerotinia in it and it becomes widespread. You might, you might, like in this field here, if you look out there, you might, in all those lettuce plants, you might find one or two that have that disease. But if you come back next year, then that disease gets up on more that gets on more and the next thing you know it's going to it's going to economically damage you because there's going to be a high percentage of plants that you can't harvest so that's the biggest um i think that's probably the the biggest benefit to, to uh crop rotation 
Okay, here's a bit, here's an important question. Have you ever found a snake out there? Have I ever found what? Have you ever found a snake in the field? Yes, I have. Yes, I have. And, I, and I'm really fair, afraid of snakes, so I don't like it when that happens. Um, it, it, it happens a little more often on the edges of the valley where they come in from the desert, but absolutely. Absolutely. There's snakes in every, there's snakes. I would say there's a snake, at least one snake in every field. Hopefully I don't run across it. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Um, let's see, someone asking, uh, speaking of scary things, uh, someone's asking about maybe uh, uh, like, do ever, anybody ever try to steal the, steal the food or take food um, out of the very, field? Very rarely. Um, I, I, I've never had a big problem with it. And quite honestly, if somebody were to drive by and ask if they could take, you know, a head or two or something, I would say yes. Um, I have on a few occasions um, driven up and seen people like loading the back of a pickup truck or loading the back of their trunk with stuff. And, and then I have to say something, but it doesn't happen very often. So what is your favorite vegetable, Mr. Howington? Favorite to grow or favorite to eat? Favorite to eat. To eat, I think it's baby broccoli um, or broccolini. I love that stuff. It's a, it's a cross between broccoli and an oriental vegetable called gylon. Looks like, a, looks like a, a, a real skinny head of broccoli on a stalk, on an asparagus stalk. But I love that stuff. Oh, do you happen to know where this particular lettuce is going? Like what, what part of the United States this particular lettuce is going to? I, I don't. Um, uh, you'd have to go in. I mean, the sales office might be selling lettuce to 20 different stores today. And so it, you don't know exactly where this lettuce is going to go until they actually ship it. They actually put it in a truck and, and then they'll know where every box went to and where it came from. That's part of our food safety also is that if something does happen, um, let's say, for instance, somebody got sick eating a head of lettuce that came out of this particular field on this particular day, we could go back and find out where every single one of those boxes that we packed today are and get them off the, get them out of the, off the shelf. Um, you know, get them out of the, the Someone's production. asking, um, we have a question about like the cost, like um, do you have an estimate on like, what is the cost for that box of lettuce? Sure. So um, it cost us about $5,000 an acre to grow it. So if you get, Let's say you get to make it easy. Let's say you get a thousand boxes an acre. So you have five dollars in growing the product. It costs about two dollars for the box. So that's seven dollars. It costs um, the labor is right around two fifty. Um, so now we're up to nine dollars and fifty cents a box. Then you have to you have to cool it, um, and that's about a buck fifty a box. So we're up to about $10, $10 $50, a box um, is, is what the cost is. So on a, on a, on a 12 count lettuce, right, you know, that you're seeing right there, the cost for us um, is almost a dollar a head, probably what, 90 cents a head. Remind us the difference between a fruit and a vegetable. Okay, so a vegetable is, is basically a plant that you eat that you don't eat, the seeds aren't in it. So for instance, a tomato, an orange, a watermelon, when you, when, you, when you go to eat those, they have seeds in them. A vegetable, a true vegetable will not have a seed in it. Um, it, it the, the seed hasn't, hasn't been developed yet. So that, that's the big difference between a fruit and a vegetable. Because I always thought tomatoes were vegetables when I was growing up, but then I found out they were a fruit. So someone's asking about if you have had to change any of your packaging or your boxing of your vegetables because of, um, of how many restaurants are closed because of COVID. That's a great, that's a great question. So a lot of people have, um, we, we don't do a lot of food service. We never have. So we haven't had to change much, but a lot of companies have had to. Yeah. All right, we are just about out of time. Um, let's see, double check the Q&A. 
Um, someone has asked me if you, a lot of kids have asked if you grow corn. No, I used to, but I don't anymore. Okay. All right. And I think I'm going to go ahead and take the final question, which is what do you call a Disney movie about vegetables? Uh, I, a fairy I tale. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That hey, was what, just for you this morning. What, a what, fairy yes. kale. A, a fairy kale. There you go. That's a good one. One thing that I would like, perfect. I would like all the all the kids to notice about these people working here. They're trying to stay safe. They're trying to keep you and themselves and their and their their coworkers safe. They're working with these masks on. It's very difficult, but um, my hats off to them. They they're doing the very very best they can to keep to keep working and keep everybody safe. And I, I just wanna I just wanna give them props for what they're doing because that's not an easy thing to do. Yeah. Oh, I was gonna say thank you, Mr. Howington, for being a part of growing our food and for keeping our food safe. Please tell all your staff thank you and we appreciate what they're doing. And we have learned so much about um, harvesting lettuce and about growing lettuce. And um, we're all gonna have a salad for lunch today. How's that? Oh, that sounds perfect. And I hope you guys have had as much fun as I have. It's really been a blast.